Sharon Short, and I guess I would categorize myself as a literary artist, if that doesn't sound too pretentious. Sounds good. Um, because I do a mix of things. I write novels. My most recent is uh, My One Square Inch of Alaska, which I'm very proud of. It came out last year with Penguin Plume, and it's a coming-of-age literary novel. Uh, I've been writing novels um, my whole life, it feels like, but this is actually the 20th year anniversary of my first novel publication. Oh, wow. Which is amazing. Yeah. Isn't that great? To me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I direct the Antioch Writers Workshop, which is in its 29th year in Yellow Springs. I've only been doing that for five years. Um, and uh, I write a column called Literary Life um, for the Dayton Daily News. That's in its second year. And it's about uh, the literary artists and goings on sure. in the greater Dayton area. And I never lack for material because this is a vibrant literary arts town. Well, I started the column in 2000 when my kids were really little and wrote a lot about uh, family life. Um, yeah. Kind of a tradition in Irma Bombeck's hometown to have people writing about family and home life yes. and domestic life and day-to-day -day life. <laughs> and uh, as time went on, um, it, it, it became time to kind of wrap it up. My kids are, well, one just graduated college uh, and the other one's a, a couple years in. And the Dayton Daily News actually did a, um, a survey to find out um, what their readers wanted to learn more about. And one big topic that came up was, tell us about authors coming to town. Tell us about the authors that live here. Tell us sure. about poetry slams and spoken word and what have you. Right. And so they asked me if I would do that column, and I agreed to do it. So the two overlapped for a while, then it was time to wrap up Sandy Check. But every Sunday, Literary Life, I couldn't, I couldn't go to all the events I write about. There are so many to, to go to, <laughs> which is very cool. I've previously written mystery novels, two series, mm -hmm. and I was kind of casting about for a new idea. And um, had a few, um, but none of them were quite sticking. And then I was at a, at a meeting where um, somebody said, hey, does anybody remember those deeds to, to one square inch of Alaska that used to get in cereal boxes? Yes. And I didn't because this came out, the, this promotion came out in the 50s and I was born in the early 60s. But this concept of one square inch of this vast territory just sort of fueled my imagination. And by then I'd been writing for quite a while, so it's not entirely shocking to me and other writers <laughs> that these two characters kind of showed up in my imagination and said, hi, yeah. tell our story of our one square inch of Alaska. So I said, okay, don't know who you are, but I'll figure this out. And um, frankly, at first I thought, you know, really, you're gonna write a whole novel about a couple <laughs> of kids who wanna get a deed to one square inch of Alaska and go visit it, really? Um, but the idea wouldn't let go. And so nine months later, I said, fine, I'm going to pursue this. And I did, and it, it turned into being one of the best decisions of my creative life. Um, not just because the book ended up being very successful, but because, um, you know, it was, it's really a novel of my heart. It's a story about dreams, embracing dreams, the power of dreams, and the importance of helping others achieve their dreams. Not just your own dream, but right. encouraging others. So it kind of fits into the theme of my work life and my personal life. Well, I came of age in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And in the 70s, uh, I think like kids always do, they're always uh, intrigued by two decades before. Yeah. So we had our 50s days So yes. in high school. So we'd wear our poodle skirts and we watched Happy Days and we thought we knew the 50s. And the 50s were supposed to be, you know, this, this perfect sort of halcyonic time for people and um, I didn't want to re recreate that because I felt like, yeah, sure, that's true if you're, you know, if you're the right gender, the right race, the right economic level and, you know, have everything just so, right. it's perfect for you in the 50s. Well, that's not really real. So I did a lot of reading about the decade in general. Um, I did a lot of research about social trends. Um, I said it in 1953 because it was actually just the right perfect mm -hmm. year to capture a McCarthyism, a to capture the rise of unions. Right. Um, and so that, that was very important to me. Um, so I did a lot of reading. I did a lot of, I, I interviewed my dad who was a union boss for a while and asked him what that was like, you know, what that transition period was like. So that was helpful. And then I did really just specific things like there was no highway system in the 1953. 
it's not until later. And so you can't just hop on I-70 and keep going. And you know, these kids weren't going to be able to get on Amtrak or a plane. Mm -hmm. So I decided she uh, would need to know, you know, she'd need an, um, an atlas. So I, I lurked on eBay for like, <laughs> for like three weeks. And it's really amazing how hard it is to find something super specific. But I yes. wanted a 1953 road atlas that she could get at a local gas station yep. in 1953. Mm -hmm. And it came on and I bought it. And I tracked their actual, the route they take is the route they would have taken. Sure. I found uh, weather data and I correlated it to where they would be on what date in 1953. So all the weather that's described happened that day in that place. That's um, and then just, you know, I looked, at, I looked at old catalogs to find out about fashion. I, you know, I watched some of the TV episodes that you can now find on YouTube of Sergeant Preston of the Yukon, yes. which was the show that had the, the promotion for one square inch of actually the Yukon territory, but everybody remembers it as Alaska. Um, TV's really changed. <laughs> I don't think I would have been as devoted. Maybe I would have if I came of age then, but okay. So I, I tried to go back in time as much as I could. And, but I think the really important thing is that the human heart is the human heart, whether it's 1953 or 2053 or 1553. Um, but I did uh, want to capture that time did, realistically. Did, Every project I write is a great big old mess. I, I can't draw at all, but I have artist pads and I'll sketch, you know, like timelines and family genealogies. And so I'm doing a little bit of this all at once. And then at some point, somehow, I guess this is the art of it. Um, it snaps together and then it does kind of become linear and I'm revising and, and, re and crafting and in a form that doesn't just look like madness thrown all over the place. Um, so I do a little bit at a time and you know when I'm writing if I don't know something I'll just I, I just well I'll just put in all capital letters N need to find out you know where there are really buttons like this in <laughs> 1953 or whatever. Um, because I, I think if I did all the research, I just I would never get around to writing. And so the column sanity check, uh, I, I just, I, I worked at a, at a large tech company for a while and was let go along with 30 of my colleagues one day and started a marketing communications business, but also just, I had freedom and I had time as I was building this business. So I started writing humorous pieces that had kind of been floating in my head. I'd never really seen myself as a humorous writer at all, but, um, they came out funny. And it was about the time I was writing uh, some of the Jos Josie short stories sure. too. So I sent a couple of these columns in to the Dayton Daily because they had um, an occasional column for guest writers at the time. And I just sent them in for the heck of it. And uh, after two or three of these came out, Ron Rollins, um, who's the uh, associate editor at the Dayton Daily now, called me up and said, you know, we'd kind of like you to do these on a regular basis and I said you've got to be kidding I mean I literally said you've got to be kidding me to the associate editor of the Dayton Daily or the features editor at right. the time because I'm not a journalist by training I've done some journalism but I'm not a right. journalist so I said all right how about if I how about he said we need a, a weekly column that's funny and we need a woman's voice and we think that's you based on these that you've sent in and I said how about if I just let them run in the, we just let them run inside the paper, kind of like in the corner, like maybe in the classified <laughs> section where nobody will read them. You were hiding. I was hiding and he's all right, <laughs> we'll get, you know, he actually put it inside the life section. And after a couple months, he called me up and said, okay, you need to make a decision. Are you going to do this on a regular basis and let us feature you or not? And I said, well, now I'm hooked. All right, fine. <laughs> um, so that's how Sanity Check was born. I mean, it was really just, I was having fun, writing from the heart, and it, it yeah. turned into this thing, which, was, which is great. I wrote a piece about embracing the power of bare arms, which I'm not doing today because it's chilly out. <laughs> um, but it was, it was about a woman, uh, I was buying a dress in, at a store, and she said, oh, I'd love to be able to wear you know, a sleeveless dress. And I said, you know, why can't you? And she said, oh, my arms are, they're, you know, they're just not beautiful, and I'm like, you're beautiful, what are you talking about? She's this gorgeous 60-something woman. I said, aren't we survivors? Shouldn't we be free to wear what we want? She said, well, I did just survive cancer. Oh. It's been a year. And I went, 
oh, for pity's sake, where the, you know, get this dress. So I wrote this column about this and put it on my blog post. And I didn't think, you know, it was one of, again, one of those, it's from the heart. The next morning I woke up, it was unbelievable. It was all over Facebook. It had been, you know, spread around. People were writing about it. People were talking about how they were crying at work, having read it. And now there's a Facebook page called Embracing the Power of Bare Arms. Um, <clears throat> and it's a Facebook group, and, you know, people are welcome to join it. Um, and it's basically women who are like, yeah. You know, and it, so it sort of tapped into body image issues for women mm -hmm. in a way that I think, you know, is for the middle-aged woman. You know, we talk about that sure. a lot for younger women, but not uh, as much for middle-aged and older women. And so it's kind of fun when you write something and, you know, it's just because you have to, and, and then you find out, wait, other people feel this way too, and it takes off, so that was a fun one. I yeah. actually attended the Writers' Workshop for the very first time in 1990, uh -huh. um, because I uh, was writing a mystery novel not one that ever became published, nor one that ever will be published. <laughs> it was a book that I needed to write to learn how to write a book. But there was this up-and-coming mystery writer who was going to be teaching, I thought, that I really adored by the name of Sue Grafton. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she was just a few letters in at the yeah. time, so she wasn't, you know, a as you know, a big, a huge she mega star. Exploded, she hadn't yeah. exploded yet. She was actually just like one letter away from yeah. exploding at that point. And I, so I went to the Antioch Writers Workshop. It was only in its fourth or fifth year at that point. And um, I have to admit, I pulled up to go into the workshop and I thought, oh, I can't do this. Because nobody but my husband knew I was writing at that point. I was terrified to let the world know. And then I thought, I've already paid for it. I already took a week off from work. He, uh, you know, what am I going to do? Drive around for a week and pretend I went to the workshop? You know? <laughs> so I went in and registered, you know, signed in. I'd already paid and registered. But, um, and everybody was warm and welcoming. It was so, talk about community, it was so embracing. Yeah. And it was a couple years later that um, my first novel, Angel's Bidding, came out that features Patricia Delaney. And I've bebopped in and out since then as a guest speaker or just to hear people lecture or what have you. And uh, the previous director um, had, had taken another job and a friend of mine who was on the board said, oh, we're hire you know, we've, we've put out the word, we're hiring for a new director, you might want to think about applying. And I thought, oh, no way. <laughs> it was again, you should write a column, no way. You should be the director, no way. Um, <laughs> and I thought, oh no. I, I, and then the next morning I woke up and I thought, well, why not? It sounds corny almost. You know, we talk about we create a community of writers, and it sounds like, yeah, sure you do. But we really do. Because, and one reason we really do is because all of our events are in person. And then people disperse, you know, across the country, or a lot of folks are from Dayton, but, but through social media, they stay together, I end up friending them, I, and I watch them help each other. Uh, but I finally reached this sort of sweet spot with this current piece um, that I'm finishing it, no matter what anybody wants, or no matter what anybody thinks, because I need to write it for me. I need to tell this story, and what I have finally learned is maybe if I need to tell this story, there will be a few people out there who need to hear it. And so that's very, that's the magic for me.